In this episode, I speak with Joe Barroso, manager of the Wines of Alentejo Sustainability Programme, or WASP. We discuss how the programme evolved from a need to respond to worsening climate conditions into a solid certification programme to help communicate the measured results of producers who take sustainability seriously. Jao also discusses how the programme consciously developed a knowledge sharing network to accelerate the uptake of best practices. Some of these best practices include the use of regenerative farming, which in a drought prone region like Alentejo is showing very positive results. The difference here, as Jao says, is between trying to survive in a desert or thriving in a Garden of Eden. Either way, viticulture at higher temperatures has to mean working with nature, as Professor Kimberly Nicholas has said earlier in the series. The last point, as Dr Gregory Jones mentioned earlier, is about finding ways to expand these best practices beyond the regional level to the national and international level. This is where the wine producers and journalists and communicators interface to tell those stories. It seems to me that it's up to all of us to try and decode what is behind the certification labels. We do this best by telling the stories of a contemporary viticulture that respects nature, promotes stewardship of the land and ultimately inspires trust in consumers that the wine industry is on a sustainable pathway. When was the Wines of Alentejo Sustainability Programme conceived and what have been the milestones in developing the programme? It started being conceived in 2013, so there was two years of brainstorm and benchmark and consultancy with the, with the sector, with the producers, in order to understand if this was actually something worth doing. Uh, so it would be something that would then would have the acceptation from the producers. And so then in 2015, it was the first milestone and it was indeed launched. In fact, uh, throughout that process, we even did kind of a public consultation to the, to the producers. So we gave them all the content and said, please, you know, speak now or forever. Hold your, hold your thoughts in, in order to make sure that the contents would be aligned with what they wanted and what they needed in terms of the sustainability practices. So then in 2015 was the first big milestone when the project was then launched. Then we started our implementation. In the first year, we had uh, an adherence of 96 members. Bear in mind, we're looking at a universe of around 220 sellers in Alentejo, around 1,800 grape growers. So we had 96 members, of, the, of which some were sellers, some were grape growers. And then throughout time, things have been steadily growing in an exponential way, which is quite satisfactory. And then in 2017, we started working on a third-party certification. So we understood that the cherry on top of the cake would would be to have a third-party certification. Bear in mind, this project was not developed for certification. This project was developed to adapt climate change, to reduce costs, to increase efficiencies, to optimize processes, to reduce impacts with nature, reduce uh, impacts within the social component and in the communities surrounding the vineyards and and the cellars. So the certification does not come as a purpose in itself, comes as an add-on, something that we understood that would be useful, obviously, in terms of, of markets, in terms of competitive advantage that this would bring to the, to the producers. So in 2017, we did, we created this work group that included four uh, certifying bodies, two of international range, SGS, uh, which is actually the biggest uh, consulting um, auditing group in the world, uh, Burro Veritas, which is also a fairly well-known group, and then two more uh, companies from a more uh, national regional level, which is Certis, which is a, a Evora-based company, so the capital district capital of Alentejo, and another one called Kiva Sativa, which is actually a Portuguese company that was just bought by an international group, Kiva. And so with these four uh, organizations, we started working on what would then become the third party certification that then was launched and this is the third milestone then was launched in august 2020 uh, in august 2020 yes in august 2020 and so uh then the fifth milestone or the fourth milestone comes with our first certified producer that then happened in uh, december 2020 it's actually it was a year yesterday that we had our first certified producer in terms of sustainability um, best practices. And so I, I would say these were the, the main milestones of this uh, of this project so far. Okay, and you, you said that the certification itself 
was kind of emergent from doing the process. Um, what gives you the, the greatest confidence that this is a greenwash free, true sustainability program that people can really trust in? Well, with no, uh, you know, false modesty is me being part of it, I think it helps because I am, a, I'm an environmental engineer by trade and I'm a consumer also. And so if there is something that I despise profoundly is greenwashing. And so I, I cannot detach myself uh, from a personal slash professional basis on what I would then be leading on. And so since I'm leading this project since its, its inception, it has always been one of my uh, drivers that green, greenwashing is something that we will not do. And in fact, it's interesting because from maybe 24, 2015, 2016, Pretty much after the project was launched and started becoming a bit known within the circuits and within the regional stakeholders, I was from the start being quite pressured to start promoting the project and speaking of the project in, in the media and in other forums. And I was always very adamantly against it because we didn't have really anything to show. We just had a really nice set of best practices written in a manual, which, you know, that's great, but that's like just, the, you know, the human declaration of human rights, the UN declaration of human rights. <laughs> it does not necessarily mean it's actually being respected and uphold. And so uh, we needed to really have critical mass. We really needed to have um, stuff happening in, in the terrain. So with this said, what happens is we have a team that works on the ground, you know, every day of the week, seven days of, uh, not seven days, five days of the week with the producers in terms to guarantee that what we are asking for is indeed being done. And it's a very detailed and complex process. And I think that one of the best proofs that what we're doing here is not a greenwashing is that we uh, started in 2015. We only had a certification launch five years later and one and a half year later, we only have so far six certified producers because indeed we have a very detailed lengthy and there's an aspect of our certification that I find quite um, interesting and, and necessary to, to explain because this uh, also kind of directly uh, helps to understand why we only have six producers certified as of yet, which is related with the chain of custody of the, of the entire process. So we want to guarantee that all grape and all wine that goes into that cellar, be that from suppliers, from third suppliers or not, that's within the Wines of All Intest Sustainability Program scope. And so because of that, and considering that we have producers that buy, you know, grapes and buy wine to several different producers and several different suppliers, in order to guarantee that that chain of custody is literally and within, uh, you know, reason and within scope, guaranteed to be in the in the wasp that's why we you know this this raises a lot of uh, obstacles and challenges for the producers to be able to guarantee the entire chain of custody and thus that the whole plethora of uh, of wines that they then put in the market uh, available to the consumer will indeed if they, they have that little stamp saying sustainably produced certified zero zero or whatever that we can guarantee and that the consumer has a guarantee that that wine indeed comes from a responsibly sourced uh, company. Okay. And when you, when you're talking about a situation where there are almost sort of legacy suppliers or people, you know, feeding in, how do you get involved? How do you meet those challenges of checking that the, what's the inputs are for? Well, WASP is a, um, the, the main umbrella organization is the Wines of Alentejo Regional Wine Grand Commission. So the Wine Grand Commission is an organization that looks into the, the DOC uh, region. So uh, guarantees that the wine that says is Alentejo wine is indeed an Alentejo wine. And so because of that, our organization has a, a fairly good control of the entire uh, wine and grape production in the region. So we kind of feed in to that already set system that then allows us to fairly easily have access to information that will help us guarantee that if, a, say, for example, Nick, you will be making wines in Alentejo and you want to certify with the, with our program, we would have access to all of your, all the data and all the um, 
the controlling documentation of all the raw materials that go in your cellar, be that wine, be that grape. And so by that, we can do the entire tracking of all of your producers up to literally the source, which will be a grape. This if you buy grapes or even the grape if you buy wine. And so depending on which one it is, we always have that control. So what we then do is go to you and say, look, Nick, pay attention that you are buying grape from this certain individual that is not part of the program. And so we would strongly advise you to engage with your supplier in order for him to become part of the program. And then maybe with your help, we can accelerate his implementation processes because often we're talking about best practices that are not involved. If you have already a management that has a lot of experience fairly easily and fairly rapidly, you can do the change that you want to see and thus create the setting that will then allow you to have your third-party certification. Okay. Um, that's interesting. And one of the things I've noticed from talking to producers is the realization that the sustainability journey is not a nice to have. It's actually integral to the future to, because of the vulnerability of the Alentej region. And can you talk a bit about the, the feedback and interactions? Because you've spoken to many more than I have. The message that's coming back to you from producers in regards to the program and their commitment to it. You know, it's a very complex theme, right? Survival is a complex theme, uh, be that of the species, be that of an uh, organization, be that of an industry. And then obviously we live in an economic, financial, economical system. So uh, all of these are entangled in the sensitivities of people and producers. And what I see is that you have kind of a couple of different approaches. You have those people which find these a no-brainer, which is obviously something that will help me to face and adapt if needed to all of these challenges that I also see happening all the time. You have other producers that first they idea because maybe a supplier told them or a client told them, look, you need to go into this program. And once they're in, they go, oh, this actually makes sense. And, oh, I already do a couple of this stuff. Well, what is it that I don't do that these guys say I should do to become more sustainable? And then with that and with the, the gaining of direct benefits and indirect benefits, be those in, in savings, both, both financially and material, and not only, but often, and it is quite interesting when a producer, say, for example, you know, the classical case is a cover crop, you know, when they start adapting cover crops, cover crops are still the challenge until that perception that the cover crop will make a, a direct competition for water with the vineyard, whereas you were in a drought prone region. And drought prone regions need the cover crops. It looks like a paradox, but it is indeed because the drought prone region will need the cover crop in order to better absorb water when it rains, rather than just have a bare soil that where the water will just hit the ground and just destroy what's there and move on somewhere yeah. else. So by implementing this kind of, uh, of uh, met methods, the producers, you know, in one year, one, two years, they start seeing the, the benefits and they start go, oh, okay, so maybe this was not that of a bad idea after all. And so that's the second level of producers that we, we, we see. Then at the third level, which are totally into it for the money. So, okay, I want to go for this certification because this will probably give me an added value in markets. But as they start implementing, because they will eventually need to focus on this, and, you know, and then they start seeing again, look, this is actually something that will really help. And what happens often is you, what you see is indeed a cultural change within the organization. So organizations do change. You know, I do a lot of training. I've trained more than 600 workers in, you know, more than 30 sellers in the last in the last five years. Even yesterday, I was doing training for, I guess, almost 30 people from the, you know, from the workers of the vineyard to the workers of the cellar to the middle management. And the truth is, you, you see in the end of those trainings that something clicked. Not in everybody, obviously, but in the most of those people, something clicks. And it's also something that I find quite interesting and goes back to what I said about my own struggle and, and, and fight against the greenwashing, which is that this kind of concepts and this kind of philosophies go way beyond the doors of the cell and go way beyond the, the frontiers of the vineyard. They go into your house, they go into your family, they go into your living room. And so uh, by by being able to, to have such a, a long reach in terms of, of philosophy almost, um, that, that's quite satisfactory on one hand and obviously then helps the producers 
to help themselves, to help others, to help the entire system, which is something quite satisfactory. One of the things I've found recurring in conversations with people outside the region and inside is that everybody is on, on a journey. There's knowledge being created. There's the training you're doing. There's people in different places doing other stuff. And that knowledge connection seems to be something that everybody has a hunger for. Everybody wants to see. How much is the knowledge sharing and dispersal a key part of this? I would say it's indeed a key part of it. So what we seem to see is that throughout the last decades, people got used to having their backs turned to each other and to work, you know, within just their own little universe and not going outside and being able to share. You know, I I worked abroad for a couple of years and one of the things I understood was that logic of keeping the knowledge is power is gone. Sharing the knowledge is power. That's the, the new paradigm. And so when I go into this project, this sharing the knowledge is power was one of my key drives because we, we had indeed companies with a lot of knowledge and we had indeed companies with lack of knowledge and with hunger for knowledge. And so what we managed to do, and this was something quite satisfactory also, was to create this knowledge sharing network. In fact, we even got an award two years ago from the European Commission. We we were considered uh, European Rural Innovation Ambassadors, I believe, because exactly of the capacity of creating networks of of knowledge sharing. So what happens is indeed that we have all of these events where we invite our producers, like we, we have the objectives and the themes clearly identified because since we have this very holistic regional broad view we understand which are the main keys that are common the main problems are common for all of the majority of the producers and so and we also know which particular producers are already addressing these main and general concerns and so we you know we invite them over to come and share their experiences with us we often ask them to also put in the return on investment on of whatever they do, because obviously the financial part is, is key. And so what we understand is that not only producers are willing to share, you know, we're not asking them what's the secret of your the great Cabernet that you do or the great Toriganus, you know, that you do. We're asking them, you know, how much did it cost that technology that you use to reduce your, you know, your energy consumption throughout the harvest? They are quite willing to, to share that. You know, you also appeal a little bit to their vanity sometimes, which is something, you know, useful because people like to show off to a certain extent. And at the same time, you know, the others are quite hunger to, to, to learn. And so I used to say that um, these guys would probably only meet in wine fairs, where they will also be competitors to a certain extent. And now they don't. Now they, they get together in friends' meetings, where they just, you know, every we make usually three to four workshops a year. And so like this year was all online, unfortunately, due to issues we've been going through. But uh, often it's it's a presential uh, event and where people just, you know, they, they, they go and see friends and then, then they go talk about sustainability and share. And then they say, yeah, you should come over and see what I've been doing in my vineyard because it's great. And then they go and do it. Even the other day I was with a producer and I said, you should go check these other guys and said, could you help us out with that? And I said, sure I can. So I give a couple of calls and they've been there already. And so that it's that kind of um, power generating capacity uh, that comes from knowledge sharing. It's not only power generating, but it's also empowering because it empowers people to be able to come back to their own managers and say, you know, this is not sci-fi. I'm not inventing. I didn't see it online. They're doing it and they're doing it and they're doing it. And so, you know, if they're do- all doing it, it's because it's well done. So let's just do it also. And so that change, it's, it's, it's a transformative approach that's been going throughout the entire region. Because if you look at other regions in Portugal, you will see definitely very worthy examples, but they're patches, they're patches of examples. Whereas when you come into Alentejo, you see a philosophy coming into the region. It's, you, you see people thinking the same way in the north, in the center, in the south, in the east, in the west, in the, in the coastline, or in the interior. They will all, obviously not everybody, but all the people who are within this project, which already represent almost 50% of the planted area of Alentejo, so almost half of the vineyards are already doing their, you know, their path they work towards towards sustainable practices. They will all have this common point called Wines of Alentejo Sustainability Program, which is something quite quite cool. 
actually. You've just touched on a couple of things there. One is this whole knowledge sharing thing is obviously critical. And obviously in Portugal, uh, the Alentejo region is, is a leader in this. How much interest have you had from the rest of Portugal in terms of either creating a national sustainability program or helping other regions in extending the dialogue, sharing the knowledge further? One thing I didn't mention, Judah, I think it's also very important as a consumer, but as also in my case, the manager of this program is transparency. That's key for any kind of uh, initiative that wants to be appalled as serious and meaningful. And, and so since the beginning, we've been saying, hey, guys, we're doing this work. You know, you're more than welcome to come over and see. I've been in the north. I've been in the center doing lectures, presenting our work. I, we even offered manuals of our program. So all the contents, like the Bible of our project, we've offered it to other regions. We got awards from wine magazines in Portugal where I went to, to receive the awards. And I said, look, we're not an island. You know, this is a, a country and the problems are cross-sectional to all of us. We all need to go into this journey. It can't be Alentejo alone. And obviously, we've been getting a lot of good feedback from a lot of regions. Obviously, some have more capacity, uh, some have less capacity. That's perfectly normal. But overall, there's a, a recognition that the road is there. There are now movements towards a national initiative. The, and I think that's quite worthy. The only aspect that we are always and will never back down on is on the solidity of the transparency, of the scrutiny, of the quality, that for us is unquestionable and un unarguable. So whatever it is that is to, to spawn from a national initiative for us in Alentejo, you know, we already were here, we'll be here, we are here and we will be here long before anything uh, uh, appears. And so what we say is that the, the quality, the scrutiny, and the, the, the veracity needs to be there. Cannot, it, it needs to be bulletproof because we are bulletproof. And so obviously, whatever it is that we will associate ourselves with or not needs to uphold the same kind of values that we uphold. And not only that we uphold, but that we pass on to our producers because ultimately the success of this project only exists because the producers adhere to it and saw in it something worthy and something worth uh, you know investing in. And so obviously... This philosophy needs to be cross-sectional or cross-regional in order to be successful as a whole, as a country. Obviously, because when you're talking about export markets who have these sustainability requirements, which are coming more and more online, do you think it's more important for you to have the Alentejo sustainability identity or the national identity as it, from a coherence to the consumer sort of perspective? Yeah. Well, honestly, I, I don't really have, I mean, when you ask questions like those of two people like me, it's always a tricky answer because we are too embedded in the system. We are too embedded in the intricacies and in the details that the system has, which the regular consumer does not. The regular consumer looks at the very least to the cost and to maybe the variety and the color of the label. That's the main aspects of decision and process. And so when you ask that, we can kind of uh, like separate that questions in the several layers that it has. And when you look at certain markets, let's call them more mature markets, often the choice of the wines that the consumer will eventually choose from is made by third parties, not by the consumers. It's uh, like the, the monopolies or the, 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 the gatekeepers that will choose the wines that will go into the shelves that then the consumers will, will then buy. And what we see in an overall uh, international perspective is that um, there's a bit of everything. You know, there are countries or regions that, or countries or organizations that only want national schemes. There are others that only want regional schemes. There are others that don't really care if it's regional or national as long as it's, you know, credible. You know, it really depends on who you're talking to. I mean, obviously, one, at least to me, one key uh, only grail on the sustainability aspect is California and the California Sustainable Wine Alliance. But then this, these guys are not accepted in Alco, for instance, which is the, the monopoly in Norway because they only accept uh, national programs. 
which does not exist in the U.S. There, are, there is not one national program. There's at least five in California. Uh, and so there's a bit of uh, certain aspects that are a bit paradoxical in that regard. But overall, I would say that national is interesting. But I mean, obviously, when you think of and coming out of Portugal, because Portugal in a more uh, worldly scenario, uh, I, I exception made probably from Dor and the port wine does not still does not have the same rep reputation as a Bordeaux or Champagne or a Piemonte. And so obviously, this is not Italy or France or Spain. This is Piemonte and Bordeaux or Rioja. And so obviously, then you look at Douro, fair enough, that's, where's Douro? Is it in Portugal? I don't even know where Douro, I know Douro and I know port wine. But you, you know, you also make port wine in, in Australia. So that, then it gets a lot of, which is not port wine, but they, they call it. So there's a lot of you know details and 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 confusion that can um, come into the the equation. So long story short, I really think that Alentejo needs to also obviously affirm itself as a region that it is. We're the biggest region in the country. We are so far the sustainable region of the country. And so obviously, if the country is lagging in terms of initiative, uh, that's not our problem. We will carry on doing what we do best, and obviously uphold and bring, raise high the flag of, of Valentejo. If then the country will come and join us, they're more, more than welcome. But again, California is not the US. Uh, Champagne is not France. And so obviously there needs to be a, a I guess, an, an alignment, a crossing, but at the same time, a parallel road that should be taken by both national and regional initiatives in this regard. You just mentioned about Alentej being the most sustainable region. You're also the most vulnerable when it comes to climate change, which has been brought up in studies. And not just vulnerable in Portugal, but in one of the most vulnerable wine producing regions in the world. You're sort of at that point where the Sahara is spreading north is pressure, the big plain. What is your concern versus hope as we enter these well, sort of decades now of accelerating warming? As an amateur scientist, my concern is great. And obviously the, the scenarios and the projections are, are not very hopeful. But what I see, and even yesterday this happened, I went to a producer that I hadn't been to a member that I hadn't been to in a couple of years. And they're in Vidigueira, which is a fairly hot region in a fairly dry part of Alentejo. When I had last been there, maybe four years ago, it was a desert, really. It was bare land, bare soil, some vineyards there, of course, but, you know, fairly dry and fairly bare. And yesterday was a bloody garden of Eden, you know. They had uh, planted lots of ecological corridors. They had lots of uh, functional biodiversity. They had cover crops everywhere. They had pastures, everything green. And not because they had, you know, uh, this, um, you know, water sprinklers, um, sprinklers, exactly. No, 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 not at all. So obviously, these guys have been doing a massive investment in terms of uh, regeneration and adaptive agroecology, in terms of creating the conditions for a more adapted strategy towards. On one hand, climate change is not obviously on the other, the survival of their investments. And this example really made me very hopeful because, as I said, it was a desert. It was a literal desert four years ago. You know, even they were telling me we, we were looking, I was observing and I was commenting on what I was seeing. And we had this like this little hilly area, uh, all green and all vegetation everywhere and trees everywhere. And the guy was even saying to me, yeah, it's funny you're saying this because you see that house over there in the hill two years ago, we couldn't get there. When it rained, we couldn't get there because it was just, you know, mud everywhere. And we did all of this work and now we can go anywhere, even if it rains or it doesn't because the soil is far more well-treated and far more, um, structured in terms of, uh, of consistency. And so, you know, this is an example. I could give you several other examples. Actually, places that you, Nick, visited on your last trip over here to Olympiad, you know, places that all of this intensive work of recovery, uh, recovery of water lines, of promotion of endemic species growth, of attraction of fauna or flora species. So all of this is definitely assisting in at least creating resilience for these producers. I, obviously, I can't say that this is yet a cross-regional philosophy, but definitely that's the way to go because 
on one hand, we have the examples. On the other hand, we have the climate and the evidences that, uh, like, he, it hasn't rained. Uh, you know, we're in 15 of December and it hasn't rained, basically. And so producers are already saying, you know, it hasn't rained. I'm getting worried because there's no water. And so obviously, and then when it rains, it will be a bomb of water, probably. It's not going to be, you know, spread throughout an entire month. It will rain in a day, which should rain in a, in a month. So if you have the soil more prepared to retain this water, if you have, you know, a water reservoir more prepared to absorb all of this water, you will gain, obviously, more than if you just keep with your business as usual, start to school attitude towards what agriculture should be or is really. So it's the integrated, more regenerative approach, which is building resilience, which is one of the, I suppose, the key factors for facing the future. Okay, well, I think that's that's all my questions answered. So very good. Cool. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks for listening to this episode in the Sustainability in Alentejo series, produced by me, Nick Breeze.